Well, again, we are very excited to have Dr. Jason Lyle with us. Let's welcome him. I uh, Come on up. I, my first opportunity to hear him was at a pastor's conference in the Northwest. So, Jason, thank you so oh, much thanks. for coming. God thanks. bless you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it's so good to be with you today, and I get to talk about uh, understanding Genesis, the importance of the real history of the universe, which is recorded for us in Scripture. We have the birth certificate of the universe. That's pretty neat. So, uh, yeah. So we have some problems in the world today. I think you would agree with that, yes? yes. Yeah, okay. You're in California. You've got some issues. Yeah, we understand that. <laughs> and if you think about it, I mean, we, we have such a tremendous blessing because, you know, the United States of America, founded primarily by Christians, certainly on Christian principles, and as a result, we have this wonderful Christian heritage. We have the most Christian churches, seminaries, Christian colleges, bookstores, Christian radio and television of any nation. It's, it's a wonderful blessing. And yet, for all of these Christian resources, would you say that we as a nation are becoming more Christian every day or less Christian every day? Yes. Yeah. How is that happening? How is it that this nation, so richly blessed by God and, and, and with this rich Christian heritage, how is it that we're becoming a pagan nation at an alarming rate? Seems like it, just in the last couple of years it's picked up. It's kind of amazing. And if you think about it, all the, all the problems that we have in society, all, all of those can be traced back to a broken law of God where people have decided we're not going to do what the Bible says, we're going to do it this other way. And that's always a problem. But in, and if you think about it, the, the intellectual justification people will give for why we don't do what the Bible says is because they think the Bible has been disproved by science particularly in Genesis. That's the place where people begin doubting the Bible because they've been taught that science has proved that millions of years of evolution is the way life came about on this planet. And that's contrary to what the Bible teaches in Genesis. You see, the real issue behind the creation versus evolution debate, it's really God's word versus man's word. That's, I mean, bottom line, that's what it's about. And that's the same as all these other issues we have in society. Are we going to do what God says or are we going to do it some other way? And whenever we do it some other way, it, it just never works out well. How about that? God does know how to, how to run this universe. After all, he created it. And he knows what's best for us. God's laws are for our benefit. They really are. They're not to, God's not a killjoy. He wants us to have life and to have it more abundantly. His laws are, are to bless us. But we reject God's word and our sin nature and the justification people use is that the Bible's been disproved by science in the opening chapter. So why would you trust what comes after it, right? If God didn't get the details right in Genesis, why trust what happens later? And if you think about it, this began in Genesis, ironically. That's where uh, God told Adam and Eve, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And effectively their response was, no, we're not gonna listen to your word. We're gonna determine truth for ourselves. Eve did a little experiment. Now, God was vindicated, but Eve was mistaken in thinking that her mind was able to judge the truthfulness of, of God's word, because after all, it was God who made her mind in the first place. So that was rather silly. But she, she disobeyed uh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and Adam followed suit, and Adam was given dominion over the world. The world fell as a result of Adam's sin. See, it used to be in this nation because of this rich Christian heritage that we have, you could say things like, well, abortion, that's morally wrong, and, and adultery and homosexual behavior, these things are wrong. And most people would say, yeah, I, I get that. Even if they weren't Christians, there was some degree of respect for the Bible. But, you know, the good book says this. But today, that foundation has shifted. Today, you say abortion's wrong, homosexual behavior's wrong, adultery's wrong, and people will say, not according to my rules. Because they're not even remotely standing on God's word anymore. They've shifted to this other foundation, and that's a problem. And when I talk about evolution being the foundation for that, what, I, I'm, what I'm referring to is the sort of the Darwinian idea that all life is descended by, from a common ancestor over millions of years of mutations and natural selection. So as animals reproduce, they reproduce animals that are a little different. Well, by the way, I don't disagree with that. You can get differences in animals, but I don't believe that one kind changes into another. And so mosquitoes are always going to be mosquitoes, unfortunately. And uh, dogs are always going to be dogs and so on. And so they can't really change. I don't believe that I'm biologically related to a turnip. Right? I believe we're biologically related to each other. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. 
but the evolutionists believe that, that broccoli is their distant cousin. And I, I, I mentioned that one time, I was speaking to a group of atheists and I, said, you know, I said, you know, you realize in your worldview, you believe that you're related to broccoli, that's your distant cousin. And one of them came up afterwards and said, weren't you kind of making fun of, the, fun of us for saying that and isn't that kind of inappropriate? And I said, well, isn't that what you believe? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, there you go then, right? <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just repeating back to you what you claim to believe. If it sounds silly, reconsider your belief, right? I don't believe we're related to broccoli. I believe we're related to each other. We're all descended from Adam and Eve. And what you believe about origins will have consequences for your other beliefs. If creation's true, you're gonna have laws because it's in Genesis we learn that God gave instructions to Adam and Eve about what to do and what not to do. And so you have law, and God has the right to do that because he's the creator. We learn that in Genesis. In Genesis, we learn that there is a penalty for disobedience to God's law. In Genesis, we learn what that penalty is. It's death, right? And, and boy, that's, that seems kind of harsh. Not when you realize the holiness of God, right? I mean, sin is open rebellion. It's treason, high treason against the king of kings and lord of lords. Treason is a capital offense. So it, it does make sense. Uh, but we, we learn that all in Genesis, laws, the idea of a lawgiver, and the idea that there will be justice done, that God is just. And of course, we've all broken God's law and we need a savior. But my point is the whole idea of laws and justice, and that all goes back to the history recorded in Genesis. Marriage, where do we get the idea that marriage is one man and one woman united by God for life? That goes back to Genesis, doesn't it? God made them male and female, the Bible says. And in, and in Genesis 2, for this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother and, and uh, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So that's where we get the idea of marriage. God created the family unit, so he gets to define what it is. That happened in history. That's where we get this idea of marriage. Or standards, standards of behavior, standards of clothing. I noticed you're all wearing clothes today. I appreciate that. I'm sure you do too. Originally, it wasn't that way. But where do we learn about the origin of clothing? It's in Genesis 3. It's right there. Or meaning of life. Why is it that human life is special and has, has value to God? Now, God cares about animals too, but the Bible says we're of more value than many sparrows. God really cares about us. Why? What makes us unique and special? We're made in God's image. That is a unique privilege. And where do we learn that human beings are made in God's image? It's in Genesis, isn't it? See, all these Christian doctrines that we're seeing crumble in our society, they're all based on Genesis. Wouldn't it make sense if people reject Genesis that they would reject the doctrines that logically follow from it? And see, that's the issue. Today, there's, there's this other possibility in terms of uh, what you believe about the past, evolution. The idea that life can come about apart from God. There's no creator. Life just kind of is one of those things that happens from time to time when the chemistry's right. And uh, well, if, if that's the case, then why would you have laws? If there's no lawgiver, why, why would you have laws, right? Evolution is supposed to work by the strong dominating over the weak, and yet laws are designed to protect the weak from the strong. They're anti-evolutionary by their very nature, aren't they? So that's not, that's not gonna work. Or, or um, why not do what you want with sex for that matter? If we're just animals, animals pretty much do what they want, why shouldn't we? Huh. Or abortion, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. Why not? In an evolutionary worldview, where we're just rearranged pond scum, why not get rid of rearranged pond scum that you don't like? So you can see, and by, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that evolution is, is the cause of all those social ills. Uh, sin is the cause of those social ills. But I am suggesting that people, that evolution gives people a way to try and justify that sin in their minds. Because you can't justify things like abortion if, if you understand that human beings are made in the image of God. That's not gonna work. And so we need to recognize our foundations are under attack in Genesis. In the minds of many people, you, you can't trust in Genesis, and therefore you can't trust uh, the doctrines that would logically follow from it. And a lot of Christians get intimidated, right? Because we got, there are very intelligent people who believe in evolution, I don't deny that. There are some brilliant scientists who believe in evolution. There are brilliant scientists who believe in creation, by the way. But we get intimidated and a lot of Christians think, well, we can't um, 
maybe evolution's the way God did it. I mean, it's got to be true with all these smart scientists uh, believing in it. And so a lot of Christians try to kind of merge the two. They, they want to say, yeah, I, I'm a Christian, but I, I believe in evolution. I think that's the way God did it. But then Genesis wouldn't be real history, would it? It can't really be justified that way. And a lot of Christians say, well, well Genesis, it's, it's true. It's just not literally true. It's not meant to be taken literally as real history. Maybe it's like poetic or more like a parable. A lot of Christians try to argue that so they can believe in evolution and still uh, profess faith in Christ. So, but, but here's the problem. Genesis is not written as a, as a parable or as, a, as poetic literature. In fact, if you look at the genealogies like in Genesis chapter five where you have in so-and-so begat so-and-so and they begat so-and-so, those kind of boring uh, genealogies that you find there in scripture. Well, those, those verses are there for a reason. They're there to tell us that these are real people that lived and it tells us their names and the names of at least one of their children and all kinds of incredibly boring information, right? That's not, that's not what you would do with a parable. Jesus often used parables in his earthly teaching ministry. And a parable is where you take something physical that we're all familiar with, and then you use that to explain a spiritual principle. And it's very, very effective. But for that reason, you want to make the story as short as possible. You wouldn't have detailed genealogies in parables. Usually you don't even have specific names. Usually there was a man or there was a certain king or what have you. You wouldn't have a list of fictional people in a parable. That wouldn't make any sense. Nor is Genesis poetic in nature. It's, it's very easy, by the way, to recognize Hebrew poetry. It's, it's different from English. We tend to focus on rhyme and meter, right? But in Hebrew, poetry is based on parallelism. That's the key distinguishing feature of Hebrew poetry. And that's where you have two or more statements that kind of go together. There's different forms of parallelism. One of them is synonymous parallelism, where you'll say something and you'll say kind of the same thing using different words. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. See how it says kind of the same thing using different words? That's Hebrew poetry. It's beautiful. You will not find that in Genesis, right? In fact, that would be a pretty terrible poem, wouldn't it? See, I, I recognize that the Bible does contain different types of literature. It does contain poetic literature in the Psalms and Proverbs, but it's easy to recognize that. And, and, and I'll grant, in those, in those sections, there are figures of speech that are not meant to be pressed in a wooden literal sense. When the Bible says there's no rock like our God, it doesn't mean he's basalt or igneous. He's not literally a rock. We understand that. It's a metaphor. But Genesis is written as history, and that is meant to be taken literally. There's no doubt about that. And by the way, those genealogies lead up to Jesus Christ. And so here's my question then for Christians who say, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus. Praise God, I'm glad you do. But then they say, I think Adam's just a metaphor. Uh, how, how can Jesus be descended from a metaphor? Right? A real person can't be descended from an imaginary person. That's not going to work. It's theologically important that Jesus Christ is descended from a real Adam, and so are we all. The Bible says he's made of, from one blood or from one man, all nations, right? We're all descended from Adam. That makes Jesus our blood relative. You are related to Jesus. And that's awesome because according to biblical law, only a relative can save you. There's an important concept in the Bible, the concept of the kinsman redeemer, where it has to be a relative, a blood relative of yours that can take, that can take your place, that can pay your penalty. That's why Jesus had to be man. That's why God took on human nature. He became one of us so that he could pay, he could take our place on the cross. That's why his blood counts for ours because we're all of one blood. Jesus is man and therefore he can pay for our, our sins. And because he's also God, he can pay an infinite penalty. It, it makes sense. But only if Genesis is real history. See, the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4. Now, they were used symbolically in the Old Testament to point forward to Christ, to, to, to show the idea of substitutionary atonement. This animal, which is innocent, dies in your place. You live in its place. There's an exchange there. And that pointed the way to what Jesus would actually do. He would actually take our place on the cross. And when we, uh, God treats us as if we were as obedient as Christ, and he treated Christ as if he had sinned all the sins that we've committed. 
It makes sense. Blood, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins because we're not related to them. Unless, of course, evolution's true. In which case, that doctrine's gone, isn't it? Yeah. See, where, where does the idea that death's the penalty for sin, where does that come from? Genesis. It's right there at the beginning. Now, that's reiterated in other places. It's reiterated in Romans. Uh, it's reiterated in uh, 1 Corinthians. But its foundation is in Genesis. Putting it another way, which Adam is non-essential to the gospel? Is it the first Adam that made it necessary for us to be saved by rebelling against God and plunging the world in the darkness and we're descended from him, so we've inherited that wicked sin nature? Or is it Jesus Christ, the last Adam, who paid our penalty on the cross? Without the first Adam, there's no need for the last Adam. And by the way, that's important because a lot of times when you're witnessing to people and you're saying you need to trust in Jesus, one of the most common responses is, why? I'm basically a good person. It, well, there's a person who doesn't understand Genesis because you take him back to Genesis and you say, well, well, let me ask you something. How many sins did it take to ruin the world? One. And it wasn't what we would normally think of as a, a particularly egregious sin. It's not like Adam murdered anybody. He broke his diet. But it was something God told him not to do. And that made it high treason. That ruined the world. And so you say, now have you sinned more than once maybe? You, you got a problem. Because if God were to let you into that, that new heavens and new earth, you would ruin it the same way we ruined the original. That's a problem. That's why we need a savior. You see, the gospel's the good news but in order to understand that, you really need to go back and understand the bad news that, and, and the bad news is explained in Genesis. The bad news is that we are lost, we're sinners, and we need a savior. The Bible really is the history book of the universe. Now, it, it does contain other types of literature, but it's primarily a history book, recording those events that have happened, the, the important ones in terms of our relationship with God. And I find a lot of people like the morality the Bible teaches, but they want to reject the history. Even atheists like some of the morality the Bible teaches. They'll say, thou shalt not murder. They like that one. They don't want to be murdered, right? Thou shalt not steal. They like that one too. They don't want their wallet stolen. But you see, the morality comes out of the history, doesn't it? The morality comes out of the history. Why is it wrong to murder? Because human beings are made in the image of God. That's a historical fact that justifies our moral expectation, you see. Jesus put it this way, he was speaking to Nicodemus and he says, I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It's a pretty good question, right? Because the Bible does talk about earthly things, matters of history, days of creation, the flood that happened at the time of Noah, the confusion of tongues that happened at the Tower of Babel. And then the Bible talks about heavenly things like morality or salvation. Both are addressed. But if you say, yes, but I'm not sure that I believe in those details in Genesis, because most scientists say that's not possible. If God didn't get the details right in Genesis, how can you trust that he got the details right on how to inherit eternal life? That's what I want to know. Does God know how to communicate or doesn't he? Now, I think God can communicate. After all, he spoke the universe into existence. I think he could probably write a book, <laughs> right? I mean, of the two, that would be the easier challenge, right? God is a linguistic being. He does know how to communicate. He created human beings in his image with the ability for language. In fact, Adam came pre-programmed with language, which I think is awesome, and I'm a little jealous that he didn't have to go to grammar school. He was just able to speak right away. He just knew language. That's pretty neat. But in any case, we, we get intimidated, though, because, again, there's some brilliant people who reject the Bible and believe in millions of years of evolution, and we think we need to go along with them. We, we want to have a foot in both camps, we want to say, I'm a Christian, I don't want to give that up, but on the other hand, I don't want to look like a fool in academia, perhaps that's part of the motivation. And so we think, well, maybe we can modify one of these two, because let's, let's be honest, God's word and man's word say something very different about how the universe began. And so if you're going to try to believe both, you're going to have to modify one of them. And the one you modify is the one you don't ultimately have your faith in. And, and by the way, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were masterful at reinterpreting God's word to fit with their ideas, their, the, the popular ideas of their time. And Jesus would not have any of that. He would take them back to the scriptures. It is written, have you not read? Take a look in Matthew chapter 15 if you want to see a very harsh rebuke 
by our Lord Jesus regarding the Pharisees and Sadducees reinterpreting God's word to fit their traditions. You can think of the culture war that's going on today a bit like these two cities. You got the city of God based on creation. God's word is true from the beginning, right? And, um, and then, of course, you've got uh, secular humanism. Secular humanism is the other big faith system in our culture today, in our society. Okay, that's the one that is competing for hearts and minds. It is based on evolution, make no mistake. Secular humanism, the, the philosophy of what we sometimes call the left, is based on evolution. Man independent from God determines truth. And there are certain symptoms that come out of that secular way of thinking if you're logically consistent, right? Because, you know, racism, for example, Darwin was a huge racist because he believed that different, what we would call ethnicities, different races evolved at different rates. And he, of course, he put himself at the top. He thought his race was, a, was the best and the other races were closer to apes and so on. That's terrible. It's unbiblical, right? According to the Bible, there's only one race, the human race. And we can explain the little differences in skin color and you know, eye shape and so on by the genetics that, ha that occurred at the Tower of Babel when God split up the people groups and split up the languages. We have different ethnicities, but we're, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve and we're all related to Christ. So a, a abortion for that matter. I mean, that, it makes sense if human beings don't have any intrinsic value because if we're just rearranged pond scum, we don't have any intrinsic value. And so why not get rid of inconvenient human beings? Let's just be honest about it. Now, how are we fighting this war? Not as effectively as we could be, perhaps. We are shooting some of those billboards, and I, and I think that's a good thing to do. We should fight against abortion, racism, and so on, sexual perversion. We need to fight against that. But if that's all we're doing, we're not fighting effectively at all because the secular humanists, they're aiming at our foundation. They're saying, you can't trust the Bible because you can't trust the first chapter in the beginning, God. We know that's silly. It's in the beginning there was a big bang and hydrogen gas and so on, which I think is silly. But in any case, that's what they claim. They claim that that's been scientifically proved, that Genesis has been scientifically disproved. And the worst thing we could be doing is helping them. There are Christians who say, yeah, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis as long as you trust in Jesus. Well, trusting in Jesus is the most important thing, to be sure. But Jesus did believe in Genesis. And, and quoted from it or alluded to it in many places. And so it does matter. It does matter. What's the uh, solution then? I think it's fine to zap billboards. We, need, we do need to deal with those symptoms, but we need to deal with the underlying problem as well if we're going to get anywhere. And so we need to defend ourselves against these evolutionary attacks where people say you can't trust Genesis because of whatever. Why well, take issue with that? Let's, let's debate that issue. Um, I believe the science confirms Genesis, it doesn't confirm evolution. We need to do some damage ourselves and point out evolution is not a, it's not a good, it's not a scientific theory even, it's a conjecture about the past that does not have good scientific support. It is scientifically bankrupt. There's no doubt about that. And if people want to try to argue with that with me, they're welcome to do so. But I, I believe the science confirms creation. And in fact, creation is the foundation for why science is possible. The fact that God created this universe and has imposed order on it, right? And, does, and continues to uphold his creation in a consistent way for our benefit. That's why we can do experiments and get certain results and trust that they'll be the same if we do the same experiment tomorrow, because God is consistent. It's the, that's the foundation for science, it's biblical creation. In any case, I like how this is illustrated though, because we're not shooting at those people, we're shooting at that city which represents a worldview that is contrary to God's word and therefore false. We want to cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We want the people to abandon that sinking city and swim over and join us on the city of God. We want them to be saved. That's why I do what I do. I want people to be saved, right? Now I can't open a person's heart, only God can do that. But I can um, destroy the evolutionary worldview and point out it doesn't make any sense, it's irrational. And we're praying that God will save many people. And we've seen that happen. We've seen God using creation ministries as, as part of the means by which he draws people to himself. And that's very exciting to see. So that's what we want to see. And by the way, that, uh, <clears throat> that city, it, it is going down, you understand. 
There's no way they can win because God is beyond time. He's all powerful. He is going to win. There, there, there's no possibility that that can succeed. It's just a question of how many victims it takes with it. And I want it to be as few as possible. What about the uh, time scale of creation? There's some confusion there, although there really shouldn't be. The Bible says that God created in six days. It tells us what he did on each of those days of creation. Human beings are made on the sixth day, and from those genealogies you love to read before you go to bed, and so-and-so begets so-and-so, and they begin so-and-so, you can add up those ages along with some other information, and you find that there's about 4,000 years between Adam and Christ's earthly ministry, which means, uh, and that, of course that was about 2,000 years ago, so that would put the age of the earth and in fact the universe at around 6,000 years. And I have to tell you, that is not popular in academia. It's not. But it is what the Bible teaches. But we get, again, we get intimidated because you'll see in the, in the textbooks, the geology textbooks and so on, that you know, the, world's, the Earth's 4.5 billion years old. The fossils were deposited over hundreds of millions of years, supposedly. And you know, there it is. It's got to be true. It's in the textbook, right? And I confirmed it on the internet, so it's got to be true. <laughs> Well, by the way, fossils don't come with little labels telling you how old they are. It'd be nice if they did. And I'm happy to talk about things like radiometric dating. People think that scientists can measure age. They can't. Age is a concept of history. It's not a physical substance that can be measured with scientific equipment. Scientists can make a guess about the age of something based on certain properties, and those are all based on assumptions, though. My point is that we get intimidated and we feel like we need to fit the millions of years into the Bible somehow. Well, where are you gonna do it? You can't put the millions of years in between Adam and Christ's earthly ministry because that would make nonsense of those genealogies, right? And in any case, nobody believes that human beings go back billions of years. Even the secularists agree human beings are recent. So people try to put the millions of years in the creation week because that's the only place they can think to do it. So where are you going to try to get the millions of years into the creation? Creation is only six days. How are you going to try to get the millions of years in there? Some people would say, well, maybe the millions of years happens before the beginning. And that's pretty easy to refute because if the millions of years happened before the beginning, then the beginning wouldn't be the beginning. It would be the much later, right? And that's not what the Bible teaches. Some people say, well, maybe we can shove millions of years between verse 1 and verse 2. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and then all kinds of stuff happened for which there is no evidence in Scripture. And then verse 2 is billions of years later. Uh, that's not going to work. That's the gap theory. I'll come back to that. One of the most common today is to say, well, maybe God didn't really mean six days when he said six days. Maybe he really meant six ages, six long periods of time. And, of course, I'm immediately going to ask, then why does he say six days? Because that is what he says. It's the ordinary Hebrew word for a day. And, uh, well, some people have said, oh, but because there is no Hebrew word for a, a long period of time, which is such an odd argument. So you think God forgot to make a word for a long period of time and just said, well, I guess I'll have to use day and hope that they figure it out. And by the way, there are many Hebrew words that indicate a long period of time, like olam, which means a long period of time. So God could have used that if he'd have wanted to, Okay. Now, there's no scriptural support for this idea that the days are long periods of time, but people will try to pull verses out of context to try and support that, like 2 Peter 3.8. People say, but Dr. Lyle, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.8 that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So see, they might have been long periods of time. It's funny, they only quote the first part of the verse. What's the rest of the verse say? One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It goes the other direction. People only try to pull the first part out to make time longer. They never take the second part out to make time shorter, right? Like, I mean, the Bible indicates about 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ's earthly ministry, but, hey, with God, 1,000 years as a day is really only 48 hours. Well, that would be nonsense. Is this verse telling us that God is just really confused about time? God created time. He understands it better than any of us do. Einstein made some wonderful discoveries about the nature of time that were unknown before him. And there's perhaps other things we still haven't discovered about time, but God knew them from the beginning. One of the, one of the things that God can do is he can declare the end from the beginning. According to Isaiah 46, that's part of the trial of the false gods. False gods can't do that. The biblical God can because he's beyond time. He created it, therefore he does understand time. This is not, and by the way, when you read this in context, 
Is it referring to the days of creation? No. When you read it in context, it's referring to God uh, seemingly delaying judgment so that many people can be saved. It's explaining God's patience by pointing out he's beyond time because he made time. He's not trapped within it. God can step into time and do things as he's done, but he is not bound by it, right? It's not giving you permission to change the word day everywhere you see it in scripture to a thousand years. And by the way, that wouldn't get you anywhere. It'd make the, that would make the earth 12,000 years old instead of 6,000. It doesn't get you anywhere close to the 4.5 billion that the secularists need. And you understand, they have to believe that in order for evolution to sound even remotely plausible. That's the motivation for it. The Hebrew word for day is yom. It's used over 2,000 times in the Old Testament of the Bible in singular and plural form. Plural form is yamim. Why is it people only question what day means in Genesis? Isn't that true? I mean, do people have questions about other days in scripture? Like, how long was Jonah really in the belly of the great fish? Were, was, I think they were ordinary days, so I think they might have been millions of years. He might have been in there for a long time, right? Days like a thousand years. You could just imagine. I mean, for some reason, that people don't seem confused by that. Or how long did Joshua really take to march around the walls of Jericho? Somebody says, I think they were ordinary days. Oh, I think they were millions of years. He might have been going around for a long time. And who knows what day means, right? The, the, the definition of yom, it really is day. That's the main meaning of it. Now, any word in, in poetic literature can take on a secondary meaning. There's no doubt there. And that includes yom. It, it can mean, when used poetically, and non-literally, it can mean a long period of time. Uh, usually when used as a, with a prepositional phrase, like the day of the Lord. I think that's more than 24 hours. But it's being used non-literally. The same is true of our English word for day. So there shouldn't be any confusion here because we can use our word day to mean a period of time longer than 24 hours. You might say back in my father's day. That means a period of time, doesn't it? Yeah. So back in my father's day, it took three days to drive across Texas during the day. So you got the word day used three times. And I'll bet you didn't have any trouble understanding it because you used context, you used the surrounding words to constrain the meaning. Isn't that right? I mean, if you think about it, most words have more than one meaning. I mean, pick any word you want to, look it up in the dictionary, and you will, you know, definition one, definition two, sometimes definition two A, two B, two C, and so on. Just about every word has more than one definition. If you think about it, it's amazing we can communicate. How do we know? Which meaning is in play? Because in a well-constructed sentence, only one meaning for each word makes sense. Context is how we figure out what the word means. Now, occasionally somebody will come up with a, uh, an ambiguous sentence where two or more meanings are equally likely, and those are usually funny. Uh, so if I said, you know, the, you know, the student center is giving away free guitars, no strings attached. <laughs> I'd say, oh, okay, yeah. That can mean one of two things. That's an amphiboly. But... Um, Usually, it's pretty easy, right? Back in my father's day, that would be a period of time longer than 24 hours. It took three days. Those would be three earth rotations because it's got a number with it. It would be three periods of time. That wouldn't make sense. To drive across Texas during the day, that would be the light portion of an ordinary day. It's very clear from context. So let's take a look at the Hebrew word day, yom, outside of Genesis 1, where we all agree what it means, and we'll see if context uh, can clue us in. For example, when the word day is used in context with a number, like the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, in all the historic, historical narrative sections of scripture, it always means day. That happens over 400 times outside of Genesis 1. We all agree those are ordinary days. Of course, if I said on the third day he went up to such and such a city, you'd know I'm talking about on the third earth rotation. We get that. If I said there was evening and then there was morning, if the word day, even if the word day isn't there, what's an evening plus a morning? It's a day, right? That's, those are the boundaries of a day, and so we get that. That happens 38 times outside of Genesis 1, and we all agree those are ordinary days. If I said there was evening that day, you'd understand that's an ordinary day. Or if I said there was morning that day, you'd understand I'm talking about an ordinary day. Evening with day or morning with day, that happens 23 times each outside of Genesis 1, and we all agree those are ordinary days. If I said there was day, then there was night. Day contrasted with night. You'd understand I'm talking about an ordinary day. So it's pretty clear. So you, you have the contextual clues here. Day with a number. Evening and morning together. Evening with day or morning with day. And day contrasted with night. Any one of those 
indicates you're dealing with an ordinary day, uh, the literal use. So let's apply these contextual clues to Genesis 1 and see if we can figure out what God meant when he said he created in six days. Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, and God called the light day, there he's defining it for you, days when it's light out, that would be an ordinary day, and the darkness he called night, you got night contrasted with day, that's going to be an ordinary day, you got evening associated with day, that's going to be an ordinary day, you got morning associated with day, that's, that makes it an ordinary day, you've got evening and morning together, which constitutes an ordinary day, and you got a number with it. God used about every contextual indicator he could possibly have used. Any one of those would indicate you're dealing with an ordinary day. God used them all. He was serious about that, apparently. What about the other days of creation? Any clues there? Let's have a look. Evening, morning, number, day. 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 Pretty clear. It's almost as if God's saying, see, they're ordinary days, and in case you still don't get it, they're ordinary days, and in case you're a little thick, they're ordinary days, and in case you're really intellectually challenged, they're ordinary days, right? I always wondered why it took so long. Pretty clear. You know, all the other units of time have a basis in astronomy, right? Uh, except a week. A week is different. But a day, for example, a day is a rotation of Earth on its axis. That's where we get a day. A, uh, a month is the amount of time it takes the moon to go through its phases. That's where we get the word month, it is a month. A year is the amount of time it takes the earth to go around the sun. But where do we get the idea of seven days in a week? Not from astronomy, but from history. It's in, it's in Exodus 20, 11, it says, for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Exodus 20, 11. Exodus 20, that's familiar. That's the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and, and that God ex further explains, in six days you'll do all your labor, the seventh is the Lord's, you're not to do any work on that day, etc., etc. Verse 11 is the explanation for why. Why is it that we have a seven-day week? Because God worked in six days and rested one as a pattern for us that we're to follow. So, and by the way, it uses the same word for day in the plural form, yamim, which never means a long period of time. Yamim is always ordinary days. And uh, it uses the same word for our work week as it does for God's creation week. So if God had really created over hundreds of millions of years, you would never make it to the weekend. Right? I'm sorry that keeps cutting out, but uh, we thought we had all the demons cast out of that, but apparently this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. So, oh well. What about the gap theory then? This is for those people who say, yeah, there's no doubt that the days are ordinary days, but maybe we can shove millions of years in between verse 1 and verse 2. That's the gap theory. So they'd like to, they'd like to say in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then billions of years of stuff happened. Maybe, maybe Satan was given charge over that original earth, and, and maybe he rebelled against God, and, and maybe God flooded, maybe there's a Lucifer's flood, and, and then maybe, and maybe this, and maybe that, none of which is in Scripture. And then they'd like to translate verse 2, and the earth became without form and void. But that's not really the right translation. It's, it's been translated correctly. The earth was without form and void. The Hebrew word there, haita, just means was. It doesn't mean became in that context. But um, you, you actually can't put a gap of time in between verse 1 and verse 2 because of the way that it's constructed in the Hebrew language. Uh, Hebrew is... Um, it uses a, a construction, a grammatical construction called a, a vav disjunctive. And that's where you have the word and followed by a non-verb, like earth. Earth is not a verb, right? Earth is a noun. So when you have and the earth, and followed by a non-verb, that indicates that that is a vav disjunctive. Okay, now what does that mean? Well, basically a vav disjunctive means that that verse is a comment or explanation or clarification of what was pre previously just stated. So in other words, verse two is clarifying the conditions that existed when God first created the heaven and the earth. It's an, ex it's an explanation or clarification of verse one. So my point is you cannot put a gap of time between verse one and verse two, because verse two doesn't follow in time. Verse two follows thematically. Verse two is an explanation of verse one. And that's important because if you just had verse one, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, you might think, oh, he made it like it is today, full of uh, life, full of 
plants and animals and with continents and people and so on. Verse 2 is clarifying that no, when God first made the heaven and the earth, it was formless and empty because God then took time. He took the remaining uh, six days to form it and fill it, you see. So it's kind of like what we'd use parentheses for in English. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, parentheses, and the earth was without form and void, etc. So it's explaining the conditions on the earth when God first uh, created it. Now, the rest of Genesis is different. It's of consecutive, that's and followed by a verb in the Hebrew word order, and said God, and so on. And that does follow in time, but there's no gaps there. And you can't put a gap in between verse 1 and verse 2, because verse 2 doesn't follow in time. What about the science? You know, there's a lot of science that confirms that God created recently and not billions of years ago. Uh, just as one quick example, I do whole talks on this, but just as one example, carbon dating. A lot of people have the misimpression that carbon dating is what secularists use to try and uh, convince people of millions or billions of years, but it isn't. Uh, carbon dating is, there, there are other methods that secularists use, uranium, lead, potassium, argon, where they, they make a, a guess about the age of something and they tend to be wildly inaccurate, but carbon dating tends to be pretty accurate and it is our friend because it gives ages that are consistent, roughly, with the biblical time scale. It's based on C14. C14 is an unstable variety of carbon that, um, most carbon C12, but one atom in a trillion is C14. It's got two extra neutrons and that makes it unstable. C14 would really rather be nitrogen and it will spontaneously change into nitrogen, giving off energy as it does, as it does so. And it does it with a half-life of 5,700 years. That means that you know, if I had a chunk of C14, after 5,700 years, half of it would have decayed into nitrogen. You don't have to do anything to it. It does it all by itself. And so um, the bottom line is, if the entire Earth were made up of nothing but C14, after one million years, you'd not have a single atom left. It decays too quickly, and yet we find it in things like diamonds. Diamonds that secularists think are one to two billion years old, based on the, these other radiometric dating techniques, and yet we find C14 in them, which can't be anywhere near that, because it doesn't last that long. It indicates that these diamonds are a few thousand years old at most, and we find that in pretty much everything that has carbon in it. We've taken dinosaur fossils. If there's enough carbon left in them, like collagen, we can, we can carbon date them. And we always get thousands of years. We never get millions or billions. Isn't that interesting? You don't hear about that in the media and most public schools, but it's certainly true. But my next question is, does it really matter? Because historically what happened is secularists came along and said, the Bible's not true. Uh, we're convinced that these rock layers were deposited over hundreds of millions of years. Again, rock layers don't come labeled. But nonetheless, that's what they thought. And a lot of the theologians, not all of them, but a lot of them compromised and said, well, maybe we can allow for that because millions of years is not a salvation issue. And you know, I agree it's not a salvation issue in the sense that no, nobody here is claiming that you have to believe in six days to be saved. We're saved by God's grace received through faith in Christ and, and nothing else, right? We don't, we don't wanna add to that. Um, but at the same time, it does matter, it is important. Uh, we, you know, we, we are saved by God's grace, but we shouldn't continue to live in bad theology after salvation. We ought to get our theology as right as possible out of gratitude for salvation, right? Not in an attempt to earn it. You can't earn it, but out of gratitude. It's kind of like gravity. Gravity is an important issue, and yet it's not a salvation issue. You cannot believe in gravity. You'll still go to heaven. You'll probably beat me there, right? Yeah. It's an important issue. And so it is with the biblical time scale. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it, it is what the Bible teaches. Most of us can't read the Bible in the original languages, but that's no excuse these days because you can get multiple English translations. They all say six days. That tells you it's been properly translated. Or you can get uh, computer software and look up the words, and sure enough, six days. That's what it is. You can check those words in other places to see that's what they mean. It is what they mean. I think it's interesting. The uh, you know, God used people primarily to inscribe his word using their personalities and experiences in a way that's a little mysterious to us, but it's not a problem for God. The one section where God didn't use a human agent but wrote it himself with his own finger in stone is the place where it says in six days God created the heaven and the earth to see all that's in them. Part of that Ten Commandments. I think that's interesting. The same Bible that teaches God created in six days also teaches things like 
the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that Jesus turned water into wine, that he walked on water, calmed the storm, raised the dead, raised himself from the dead. Same Bible teaches all those things, right? And yet many people think, yes, but most scientists say six days of creation is not possible. I'm going to reinterpret that section as poetic or, or what have you, but as non-literal. Well, I got news for you. Most scientists would say a virgin birth in human beings is not possible. Uh, walking on water is not possible. Resurrection from the dead is not possible. Are you going to reinterpret those portions as non-literal? Because the literal resurrection of Jesus, that is a salvation issue. If Christ is not raised, you're still in your sins, your faith is in vain. The Bible directly says that. Now some people say, oh, but that list on the right there, Dr. Lyle, those are, those are miracles. And so they're not constrained by the scientific method. I agree. But wasn't the creation of the universe a miracle? If not, I'd like to see you do it. There's another reason why we don't want to add in the millions of years, and that concerns these fossils that we find all over the earth, and we do find fossils all over the world. I'd expect that. There was a worldwide flood. It's going to kill organisms, bury them in sediment. I'd expect that. But the secularists believe that, no, there was no worldwide flood. The fossils were deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years. If you hold up a fossil and you say, yeah, this is 100 million years old, you've got a huge theological problem because a fossil is a dead thing. And if you got death 100 million years ago, you've got death before Adam sinned. In fact, you got death before Adam existed. But wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say that death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin? By man came death? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? That it's an enemy that was introduced when Adam sinned? But you see, if you believe in millions of years, even if you don't believe in evolution, but you say, I think maybe God created over hundreds of millions of years of death and so struggling and so on, you've got by death came man. Which is it? By death came man or by man came death? You can't have them both ways. Those are logically contrary positions. When God first made the heaven and the earth, he saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good, the Bible says. It wasn't just the Garden of Eden. God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. But if God, had, you know, if animals had been living and dying and killing each other for millions of years, and then God finally got around to creating Adam and Eve and said, oh, it's all very good. That means you got the Garden of Eden sitting on top of millions of years of death, struggling disease, bloodshed, and so on. That's a problem. You know, we find fossils with evidence of disease in them, things like arthritis, cancer even. There's a field called paleopathology that studies evidence of disease in fossils. Were those diseases already in the world when God looked at it and said, oh, it's very good? No. That wouldn't make sense. Because if that were the case, then that would mean disease is very good. So why would you bother praying for your sick friend? It's very good that they're sick, right? No, Jesus healed the sick. He temporarily reversed the curse, and he will in the future permanently reverse the curse. Now, some people say, oh, but I think it was just human death that was introduced when Adam and Eve sinned. But I don't think you can defend that biblically, because when, when Adam and Eve sinned and God confronted them, he then provide, he, um, he provided skins to cover their nakedness, right? Because they tried to cover their own shame, and they, that was insufficient. So God provided skins of clothing. Those would be animal skins, which means God killed an animal or animals to provide those clothing, that, that clothes for Adam and Eve. Kind of a picture of the gospel, isn't it? The Bible doesn't say what animal he used. I always thought maybe it was a lamb. That would make sense. Kind of point the way to the lamb who would actually pay for sins. So, but in any case, uh, no, God instituted animal death when Adam and Eve sinned. And people say, well, that's unfair. Why do animals have to suffer when Adam was the one that sinned? Because God gave Adam dominion over all the animals. He had authority over them, and that is the nature of authority. When someone is in authority and they do something wicked or stupid, it affects everyone under their authority, right? You're in California, you know this, right? Yes, we get that. Now, some people would say, oh, but I think it was just, uh, I, I think, you know, that I got you here because you had to have plant death before Adam and Eve sinned, right? Because presumably they were eating plants or plant parts because modern biologists classify plants as living. But the interesting thing is the Bible doesn't. The Bible does not classify plants as living. It uses a different system. And uh, the, the Hebrew word for living is nefesh. It applies to human beings and animals. Human beings and animals are nefesh, nefesh kai, living creatures. It's never applied to plants. It's never applied to plants. Plants are not referred to as nefesh kai anywhere in scriptures. They're classified as food. For, for living creatures. 
And so, um, and, and we sort of know that. We know plants are in a different category. They're not alive in the same way we are, in the same way that animals are, right? We, we get that. You can talk about a dead plant, but it was never, it was not, not like it was ever really conscious or anything like that. You can talk about a dead battery. It was never really alive in a literal sense, right? And we sort of know that. You come across, if you come across a dead tree, you think, well, that's pretty nice, I, you know, that works. But if you come across a dead animal, there's something disturbing about that because that's an intrusion into a world that was once uh, perfect, that was once very, very good according to God's own standard. Did you know you can't consistently believe in millions of years and a worldwide flood? because either those fossils were deposited over hundreds of millions of years or they were deposited primarily by that worldwide flood. You can't have it both ways. And so uh, I think it's interesting, folks who believe in billions of years tend to reject a worldwide flood. There's a prominent teacher over in Pasadena actually who teaches that, he says, oh, there was a Noah's flood, but it was a local event limited to the Mesopotamia Valley. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not what the Bible says, right? Genesis 6, 17, God speaking, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. Not from the local Mesopotamia Valley, but from under the sky. That would be everything. Everything that is in the earth shall die. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. The mountains were covered. All flesh died that moved on the earth. Every creeping thing, every man. Noah only were remained alive, and they that were with him on the ark. By the way, you can't have a local flood that covers the high hills. What would that look like? It would look like that. Local floods don't cover the high hills, right? Because water seeks its own level. Or what was the purpose of the rainbow? God's promise never to send another global flood or local flood? If it was a local flood and God's promising never to send another local flood, then God's broken his promise thousands of times. But you know what? We haven't had another global flood. Not after that original. Why spend all that time and energy building an ark the size of an ocean liner, taking two of every air-breathing land animal, including birds, for a local flood that you knew was coming? Wouldn't it be easier to just, you know, move? Right? Yeah. Yeah, it would. So, this is why we do what we do at the Biblical Science Institute. We want people to be saved. We want them to have confidence in God's Word, because you can. And most of the other... Uh, presentations I do and resources I have show how science lines up with a literal historical genesis. That's why we have these resources. Uh, some of the resources that we have in the back, and by the way, the checkout will be over on that side by the banners, so you can, you can pick them up anywhere. But um, we have this presentation, Understanding Genesis, on DVD, if you want to get that. A little bit of a slightly longer version than what I did today. I've been told that I sometimes talk too fast, so I wrote a book on it, and I wrote it really slowly. So you can take your time with that, and hopefully that'll, <laughs> hopefully that'll make sense. Ultimate proof of creation, I'll be doing that with the uh, students uh, tomorrow, actually, at least uh, uh, one of the sessions. How to give a bulletproof argument for biblical creation. Very powerful. Very different from what you might expect. Doesn't involve a lot of techie science or anything like that. Uh, and then we have that on DVD as well. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Better Enjoy the Night Sky from a Christian Perspective. That's just a fun resource. If you want to know when the next meteor shower is coming up and so on, it's actually not too, it's actually in a couple weeks, so there you go. And uh, a lot of fun. If you want a more an apologetic book, How to Refute the Big Bang in the Billions of Years, this is it, Taking Back Astronomy. Uh, we've got one on the physics of Einstein, if you ever wanted to learn about black holes and is time travel possible and stuff like that. Truth is stranger than fiction. Keeping, uh, we have Keeping Faith in an Age of Reason, looks like we're cutting out again. We have Keeping Faith in an Age of Reason, which answers over uh, 400 alleged Bible contradictions. That's kind of fun. And uh, Introduction to Logic. I, I've really, I started to recognize how important logic is. Right reasoning. That's actually more important than knowing lots of facts, is to know how to think properly, to know how to use facts. And uh, I find that to be a tremendous blessing. And it's something, logic is something that only makes sense in the Christian worldview. Because you're basically, you're thinking, you're learning to think in a way that's consistent with the character of God. And that is wonderful and powerful. So we have Introduction to Logic, we have a teacher's guide for it, if you want to get that. I did a Sunday school series called Get Logical, where you, it goes through the book, and it's 10 Sunday school lessons on logic. We have the, on uh, DVDs. Um, a lot of great resources, I won't go through all of them, but especially since you, oh okay, it's, is it cutting back in? 
This is a fun one too, fractals. You might leaf through that. Every picture in that book, it was not drawn by a human being. It's, it's beauty that is, built in, that is built into the universe by God in an aspect of creation most people never even have thought about. We have that on uh, Blu-ray and DVD as well. Uh, we, if you wanted to get the best of our books together, we have a book pack. You can get kind of the best of them for a 20% discount, the best of our DVDs for a 20% discount, or the best of everything. That's our library pack. That's a 30% discount. We only do the packs here at, here at these conferences. So uh, all the other ones you can get on the website. But uh, if you want to get the packs, that's a good way to do it. And uh, if you wanted to do that, just go straight over to the, to the um, banners over there, and they'll give you a library pack. We have some children's resources as well, like Answers Books for Kids. Those are wonderful wonderful resources. We do have a free monthly newsletter. There's a little sign-up sheet over there. Uh, make sure you put your email address. It's an electronic newsletter, so if you don't put your email address, you'll get nothing. But uh, do sign up for that. And there's no catch. We just want to bless you. It is a totally free newsletter, and so there's not too many things free in this world, just salvation and our newsletter. So, uh, and then check us out on the web as well at biblicalscienceinstitute.com. I want to thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Well, it is so vitally important that we believe the opening line of the Bible. And I love the way he presented it because that's the foundational battle that there is. We either believe what the Word of God declares or we don't. And so all this other stuff of, of trying to do gymnastics to bring it around. But I, for one, have no problem believing in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything else follows. Amen. Let's all stand. And again, we will be back in this room tonight. So invite your friends to come. It'll be on dinosaurs. Again, it will be open for anybody that wants to come tomorrow morning. Uh, we'll start uh, around 8.30 in here tomorrow morning as well. And that way we can leave all the... Uh, resources that are here. So uh, tonight's service again in here at six o'clock. God bless.